Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Dave. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we begin, if you could take a minute and fill out the contact card below so we can connect with you, that would be awesome. Isn't God great? God is here for you. God is here for me. So let's join in and sing our praises to God. so glad that you're with us today. My name is Jason and uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Corbett and we are about to jump back into the book of Mark. But before we do that, I want to just take a moment 
and I want to celebrate something with you. This past Tuesday, uh, Pastor Aaron and his family welcomed uh, a baby girl, their first baby girl. Her name is Ellen Jane Hopkins, and uh, we're just excited that she's here. Uh, Mom and baby are resting at home, and they're doing very, very well. Uh, Maybe you didn't know that that had happened. Uh, A lot has changed in COVID. We don't get to see each other as often and whatnot, but I I do know. I know your heart, and I know you want to do something for them. So I've come up with an idea. Uh, I want to give them a gift. I want to give them an extremely practical uh, and necessary gift. And we all know the best gifts are both practical and necessary. Am I right? Well, probably not. But in this case, it's a great idea, and I hope you want to jump on board with it. Um, I want to give them diapers. I know that sounds kind of weird, but they're going to need a lot of them in the coming months and years. And uh, I think it'd be wonderful to be able to bless them uh, with just a stack of diapers of all sizes and shapes um, for, for the future of, uh, of taking care of this child. Now, they use Rascal and Friends, which are found uh, at our local Walmart. And uh, if you don't have the time to kind of do that, maybe you can just drop off a gift card. But we're going to be collecting diapers and gift cards uh, all through the next couple of weeks, right up till February 1st. So if you want to drop those off to the, to the church office, uh, we want to bless them and give them uh, this very practical yet necessary gift. Um, and I hope that you want to partner with me in doing that. Uh, you got that? Good, great. Let's uh, Let's dive in here. We are in uh, into the, the book of Mark. Mark, uh, we've been learning through this. We're, we're in chapter one. We're, we're still in chapter one. So if you want to turn there, uh, we're going to take a look at this. But Mark is presenting to us uh, the good news that Jesus came. And he's telling us all about uh, what we did. His, his gospel is shorter and more fast-paced uh, than the other three gospels that we have. Um, but But the idea here that Mark wants to tell us what Jesus did and that he's come uh, to save us, but also to serve. And uh, one of the verses that we've been looking at every week and reminding ourselves of is Mark 10, 45. It says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And throughout this Throughout this series and, and ongoing, uh, we've been challenging each other, and I want to challenge you today, if maybe this is the first time you're hearing about it, I want to challenge you in this 1045 challenge that we're walking through to, to serve others just as Jesus did. And I think sometimes we can overcomplicate things. We can try and make it too hard, and we can, we can think about these grand ideas about what we possibly could do, uh, but then we get stifled by the, the fact that we don't have the, the money or the time uh, to do them, and I think we can we can simplify things. Uh, earlier this week, uh, one of you told me a story about how how you have just been challenged by God uh, to go and to serve uh, the homeless people in our in our city, and there are a lot of them, and they are they are in need of clothing, they are in need of food. Um, but this person highlighted something to me, uh, and I want to highlight it for you that that food and clothing, yes, are necessary, but something else is necessary is respect and dignity. And this person has been going down to Phoenix House and just hanging out with these people, getting to know them, hearing their stories, letting them uh, just talk to him and allow, he has the opportunity to, to talk to them about what God is doing. And he, uh, he told me that, that through this, God is showing him so much and he is learning so much about uh, God's heart uh, for all people. Uh, if this is something that really interests you, I can put you in touch with with Scott Earl at Phoenix House. Uh, I know he'd love uh, to have you uh, be a part of this. And I want to encourage you, keep up the good work. Uh, keep up uh, accepting this challenge and taking it on. Because when you do, you live out our church's mission, which is to show the love of Jesus to everyone we meet. All right, let's dive in. Chapter 1, I'm sure you're already there. We're going to pick it up at verse 21, and we're going to finish the chapter today. Uh, So we'll be moving on uh, next week. So far in this book, uh, we've learned that Jesus has come uh, and that he is is here. His good news is that that sin is defeated and that he has overcome it. Uh, and and we get to we're going to get to see that played out throughout the book of Mark. We're also introduced to this guy named John who who made a way for Jesus, who who opened up a path. And I hope last week that you're encouraged to to make more time and more space uh, for God uh, in your life. And and now we're we're just about to enter into the, to the to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is where it all begins. So let's let's pick it up in Mark uh, chapter 1, 21 and 22 for now. 
It says, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as a scribe. So let's just pause there for a minute. Chapter one is a roller coaster. Like I said, we learn uh, about John the Baptist, but in the in the ten verses preceding this, um, Jesus comes out and is baptized by John. Uh, the Holy Spirit descends on him, and the and the Father proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God. Not uh, not only did did Mark tell us that at the beginning, but the very words of God come down and affirm that. Uh, then he is uh, taken out into the wilderness and uh, by the Spirit, and he is tempted by Satan for forty days. Uh, and then he comes back, uh, he is ministered to by the angels, and, and John is put into prison, and he calls four of his disciples. That's just ten verses. Like I said, Mark likes to move fast. And here we are, and Jesus and his disciples are entering into this city called Capernaum. Now, this is a very important city uh, in the Galilean ministry of Jesus. He spends a good portion of his time there. In fact, later on in the scriptures, it actually it tells us that, that this becomes Jesus' home, that, that he, he begins to do life here. And, and there's a lot of things and a lot of, a lot of miracles happen in, uh, this one, in this one city. But he's entering into the synagogue. Now, uh, sometimes we might think that a synagogue is like a temple, and it, it, it is in some ways. But uh, I want you to think of it more like a community center where, where things happen, where life happens, where, uh, where birthdays happen and town hall meetings happen. That's what a synagogue is. And when... When Jesus is entering into this, he's not interrupting a service. He's not, uh, you know, bolstering his way in. He's part of the community. And he starts to, to speak about the very things that they were speaking about and discussing uh, what they were discussing. And I'm sure it was the word of God. I'm sure that they were, they were learning that and, and going through that. But it says that Jesus spoke with authority, not like the scribes. Now, if you're wondering what, well, what did the scribes speak like? Well, the, the scribes were the teachers of the word. They were the ones who were to, to tell the people what God was saying through his words. If you've got your Bibles in mind, I've got a footnote. You can go down. It says, one having authority. What, it, what it's saying there is Jesus taught with an air and an insurance and an assurance and a finality because he spoke with God's authority and he didn't quote other people like the scribes did. And that's what they did. And, and this is just more evidence that, that the religion of the day had become stale and dry and, and not approachable or, or reachable by the people. Like I talked about with, where John's message was so, so fresh about repenting and turning from their sins that Jesus comes in and he begins to speak with authority. And you can tell the difference, right? You can tell when someone is, is kind of talking out of their hat and they really don't know, but they're just giving you information. For example, uh, if you invited me over to your home uh, to, to give you some advice on home renos, um, I might be able to give you some advice and I might have some good ideas, uh, but I really don't know uh, the heart of it. Now, if you brought in a, a veteran or someone who's actually trained in it and does it, you would know and, and you would have a confidence in what they're saying. Now, that's, that's what they're looking at. Jesus is the builder. He's the one who was there at creation and he is, he is sharing with them what God uh, what God is, is saying in his words. And there's an interesting thing that happens. Remember, Mark moves fast, so we're going to move fast uh, with him through this today. Picking up in verse 23, it says, Then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, we don't know what Jesus was speaking about. We, we don't have that context. We, we aren't given that he was speaking on creation or, 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 or anything like that. We just know that he spoke with authority. And he spoke with such authority that, that, that an unclean spirit, a, a, a demon, understood who he was and, and took notice of, of Jesus and his words. And it, and it bothered him because he feels threatened by this. There's a couple of other things that I just, that I noticed that just kind of tickled the back of my brain a little bit. It, when this spirit comes up in the synagogue, uh, what was he doing there? How long has this unclean spirit bun been among these people? Without notice, perhaps. And assumingly, the, the scribe was speaking about the Bible as well, speaking about God's word as well, and yet this unclean spirit didn't seem bothered by that. But when Jesus spoke, 
there was a difference. There was an authority that came with his words that mattered. It goes back and speaks to, the, to how the religion was at the time. The second thing that comes to mind is, was this unclean spirit known to people? Was, was it just like, you know, yeah, Jerry is just always crazy. He's always saying weird things and, and we're just going to leave him alone. Or was this something that, that just welled up and, and that the, the spirit couldn't hold back any longer because Jesus uh, spoke with such authority. But either way, whatever, whatever case, whatever, whatever came about, the presence of Jesus struck fear into this unclean spirit. Verse 24 and 25, it says, what business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? He knows who he is. He knows where he's from. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. Again, the people were amazed. We've seen this a couple of times. Why, what, what is Mark trying to tell us that the people were amazed? They were amazed. What he's letting us know is that that they're, they're hearing something new. They're seeing something new. They, they may have heard the words before, but they're, they're seeing them in a different light. I know that you've uh, had that experience. Maybe you've, you've heard some information or you, maybe you've heard a sermon where, you know, you, it's from a very familiar passage, but for the first time, it's like, oh, that's what it means. That, that's kind of what's happening. They're amazed. And we see in verse 27, it says, they're all amazed. So they de- debated among themselves, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands and even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This event tells us something very, very important. And Mark's going to tell us uh, and highlight this importance over and over throughout, uh, his, throughout his book. He wants us to know that Jesus has control over the spiritual. And that power it comes from, uh, it comes from, from God. And we, we see that, and the demon says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Mark wants us to see not just uh, Jesus' authority, but his authority through the power of God at work. The following uh, next passage, again, Mark jumps fast, so we're going to move with him. Uh, The disciples leave uh, leave the the synagogue uh, and they enter in uh, to a home. It says this in Mark 29 through 31. And immediately after, this again, those fast words that that Mark uses, they left the synagogue and entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Those are the four disciples that Jesus called earlier. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and they immediately spoke to Jesus about her. He came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she served them. Now, two things I want to highlight here. The they we refer to in the previous passages seems like it might just mean uh, the people who were in the synagogue. But you have to understand that that these four disciples had just committed themselves to Jesus. They really didn't know. They They finally had a rabbi that could follow, but they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And the they that is spoken of here includes them, that they were amazed. And here we see them again amazed at what God has done because he he raises her hand and lifts her lifts her up and she the fever's gone she gets up and starts to serve them I don't I don't know how long she was ill I don't know uh, much about her we just know that she was sick and Jesus immediately spoke to her and she became well I don't know about you but anytime uh, I get sick it, it takes me a few days to recover to get back to normal I mean Marla would attest to that I get maybe that man cold everybody talks about I'm not really sure if that exists but um, I'll work with it as long as I can but when when Jesus speaks here it's almost instantaneous. She is made well. There's another, another part as we move through the chapter. Jesus went on later to a nearby town, picking up in verse 40. A man with leprosy came to see Jesus, imploring him, begging him, and kneeling down, saying to him, If you are willing, make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out with his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. So why is this important? Why is, what is Mark trying to get us to understand? Why is it important for us to grasp the reality of Jesus' authority? I kind of think Mark knew that I'd read this or that you'd read this. And, and maybe not you and me exactly, but people like us who had doubts and fears and, and weren't 
easily to trust. I think he knew that we would have a lack of faith in in Jesus' ability and his authority to, to save us, to heal us, to bless us. I think he knew that and he wanted us to understand that Jesus has the authority not only over spiritual things, over demons and unclean things, but, but over our physical needs as well because we are physical and spiritual beings. The Gospel of Mark is all about Jesus' ability and his authority to do great things in us and through us. You and I are physical and spiritual beings, beings and, and one affects the other. Paul highlights this that, and reminds us that our biggest battle is not necessarily in the physical, but it is in the, in the spiritual. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against each other, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We battle against a spiritual adversary. But a spiritual adversary who is afraid of the one who lives in us and yields and wields, excuse me, that authority. In the coming chapters, we're going to see Jesus speak and he's going to calm storms. We're going to see him speak and he's going to still the sea. He's going to heal the lame. He's going to give sight to the blind. He's going to feed thousands and thousands. He's going to call more disciples. He is going to raise the dead to life and forgive sins in the coming chapters just by the power of his word. My question for you today, I want to leave you with this, is where do you need to to, to let Jesus step in and, and speak authoritatively in your life? Where are you sick? Where are you hurting? Where are you disobedient? Where are you, uh, where are you moving away from God's will instead of towards it? Where, where have you given up in life? Where do you feel like you're all alone and there's, there's no one there to help you? Because that's where Jesus wants to step in. That's where his authority is. I want to remind you, you are not alone, that we have a king who has come to earth, who is in control, who has, who, has, who has power over the world we see and the world we don't. He's the one who has the authority to speak into your problems, to speak into your pain, to speak into your anxiety and your fear and your, and your doubts and your failures and, and all of your insecurities. Mark wants us to know that Jesus is in control. Even though throughout the, this, this passage and this, this book, we're going to see there are times where it feels like Jesus is not in control. He is. He has the authority. He has been given that by the Father. And it is free for you and I to tap into. So the authority of Jesus in your life is paramount. Because anything you face, he's already overcome. He's already defeated. And in the darkest moment of this book, when Jesus is on the cross and dying, it seems like his authority is gone, but it's not. It's what he came for. It is his purpose to come and to die for us and to be raised to life again. Not just to heal us and, and make us feel good, but to redeem us and to restore the relationship that is so broken and so lost between us and the Father. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just come before you now and we, we thank you for the, for the many blessings and healings that you have provided. And Lord, we ask and, and pray for more and expect more because we know your authority, we know your power, and we know your strength. And Lord, in the darkest points of our lives, when we are not sure or certain that you are there, Father, would you remind us that you are? that you are standing beside us, that you have true power and authority over all. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for your people. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way where the walls are closed. Another in the fire, standing next to.
Hey church, thanks for joining us today. One of the most inspiring things I find from this series is when we share the stories of how you're embracing the 1045 challenge. Please continue to send in those stories so that we can share them and inspire others to take up this challenge and show how great our God is. Thanks for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure worshiping with you. Take care, we'll see you next week.